Welcome to the Abundant Life Cathedral Church of God in Christ broadcast. Call your family, friends, or neighbor and tell them in the next 30 minutes, a lesson from God's word will be shared that will be a sense of direction and edify your spiritual life. My brothers and sisters, with all the recent events that has taken place, the church can ill afford to go back to business as usual. There's an urgency for all of us who wear the name of our Lord to get involved. With the medical and cultural pandemic that we're in or experiencing, many people are asking the question, where do we go from here? My brothers and sisters, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, this is not a time for romantic illusions or empty philosophical debates. It's a time for action. With that in mind, I uh, invited one of uh, our dear sisters. Uh, she is in school right now at Duke. Her name is Evangelist Crystal Bracy. She's an MDiv student, full-time student matriculating at Duke University in a Master's of Divinity degree program with concentrations in homiletics and African-American studies. She is a recipient of Duke University's prestigious Julian Abel Awards first presented in 1989. The awards are given annually to honor the significant achievements of black community members and their allies at Duke. Bracy was named Divinity School Student of the Year in April of 2019. And she was elected by her peers to represent them two years in a row as Black Seminarians Union President. She's a native of Oakland, California. Bracy earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. She is currently pursuing theological education, pastoral studies, and counseling and chaplain training, and her future educational plans include law school. Wow. Bracy's research and studies have taken her to the continents of Africa, Europe, South America, and extensively throughout the continent, continental U United States. In addition to her academic credentials, Bracy is a licensed evangelist, missionary of the Church of God in Christ. Professionally, Bracy served as executive assistant to the SVP of pharmacy at Safeway Incorporated for seven years until she resigned from her position to devote herself exclusively to school work. She has been named to the Whole Truth Magazine 40 and Under, 40 awards, and she is a recipient of the 2019 Kojic Achievers Awards, top 20 under 40 award by her beloved church, the Church of God in Christ. Alongside her scholarship, she is passionate about social justice and improving the spaces in which people of color study, work, worship, and live. Outside her career, Crystal energetically volunteers within the Durham community. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, traveling, and spending time with a friend's family and other loved ones. Why don't y'all help me welcome Evangelist Crystal Bracy? Just put your hands together, everybody in the office, 
and say, welcome, Crystal. She is going to teach tonight's Bible study. I'm just going to sit here and listen. My ears are open and I am watching. Go ahead, Crystal. It's all yours. God bless you, Bishop, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I'd like to greet all of you from the Abundant Life Church family. Uh, honor to your pastor and to our First Lady, Lady Beverly Powell. Again, I appreciate having the chance to come um, and share the word of the Lord for tonight's Bible study. Uh, first and foremost, one of the things that Bishop desired that I did tonight was to give uh, some uh, concrete steps on the ways in which we can get involved. Obviously, with uh, the social climate uh, of our world today, a lot is happening. And a lot of people are asking, how is it that we can get involved? Um, prayer, number one, prayer uh, is still the key and it changes things. Mm -hmm. uh, so while we are praying, we are uh, looking forward to the hand of God at work to change uh, some of the ills of our society, but protesting and participation is also needed in the journey right. to justice. One of the things I want to add is that not everyone is made for the front line. So don't guilt trip mm -hmm. yourself because you, you must be on the front lines to support. And this goes out especially to those who are disabled or chronically ill. Um, they're caretakers for nurses, doctors, uh, grocery store workers, and other essential persons. You all can support in other ways. So uh, there's a list that I shared a couple of weeks ago of ways in which we can get involved in this fight towards justice. Um, a couple of the things that you can do are donating to a bail fund in your area or around the country to help those who are leading the protests. Like I said, even if you are not out there on the front lines, you can help those pastors and those ministers and those others who are out there on the front lines. Um, donating medical supplies to people that are working as medics uh, at the protest, donating money to the NAACP. Uh, you can That's feed good. people by buying food and water uh, or making food, donating it to those who are uh, part or affected by the protests. You can volunteer um, at the, the non-hot zone areas to supply food and water, uh, continuing to educate the people around you. And this is also mm -hmm. emotional labor. Um, you can pick up people from the hot zone areas if it's needed uh, for your friends or family members who may be involved in the protest, uh, offering to watch their children um, if they're organizing and they're needing to be on the front lines. One of the things that everybody can do and needs to do at this point, confronting racism wherever you see it. This can be online. Right. This can be family, this can be with friends, this can be at work with your co-workers, this can be at the dinner table or at, at the lunch mm -hmm. counter. Confront racism wherever you see it. Call it out. Call it out. Make sure you're confronting it. Um, sharing links for resources for protesters, like I said, bail funds and um, information, safety precautions. You can share those type of uh, that type of information. Um, sharing anti-racism resources in books that can help people That's to good. learn about our country's history. We need to learn our country's history from the perspective of African Americans. Obviously, our That's lens right. tells a completely different narrative, and so these stories need to be told and not ignored. You can donate directly to frontline people and organizations. Um, obviously, rest, resting. This is uh, revolutionary and doing our best to rest when we can and taking care of ourselves and uh, those around us as much as possible. Um, posting Black Lives Matter signs in your yards, mm -hmm. uh, wearing it on your T-shirts, on your clothes as a sign of resistance and letting people know where you stand. Um, a big thing that we all can do, support Black black owned businesses. Okay. And don't right. ask for discounts for black owned businesses. <laughs> there is a list that I would like to give um, a shout out to. It's called the Nile list. You can Google it. The Nile list is a directory where you can find list. black owned businesses wherever you are. Um, obviously vote. Okay. If you are not registered to vote, please register to vote. 
If you are, help those around you, friends and family members who may not be registered to vote for this upcoming election. Um, refusing to patronize businesses or spending your money where they don't share your same values. So if you disagree with President Trump's campaign, then don't support businesses and restaurants that fund his campaign or give him money. OK, so your you can use your voice through your dollar. And one thing that, that Lady Beverly, that Lady Powell actually said that I thought was so important, keep your cell phone charged. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the George Floyd murder uh, in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. But the young lady who filmed the viral video, she was on her way to the corner store and had no idea what she would encounter on her way to the store. So you never know. Keeping your phone charged could be a matter of life and death for you or for a loved one. You have no idea what's out in the street. So make sure that you keep your cell phone charged every time that you're getting ready to head out. That's so good. tonight for... Uh, our text, we're going to look at Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 35. Um, I'm not going to read the entire passage uh, because it's very lengthy, but we're referencing Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And we're going to talk about the journey to justice. OK, the journey to justice. Eight minutes and 46 seconds is the amount of time that George Floyd was apprehended by the police with the knee blocking his air passageway and restricting his ability to breathe. Quite similar to the George Floyd narrative is the one that surrounds the lynching of 14 year old Emmett Lewis Till in August of 1955. Now, hundreds of black people have been lynched by 1955. However, the cruelty and the inhumaneness of his murder was displayed for all of the world to see when his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, she courageously insisted on a public funeral service with an open casket. Seeing the open casket of a 14 year old child whose body was beaten beyond recognition. It sparked the historic civil rights movement. Images of his bloated and mutilated body were published in magazines and newspapers rallying popular black support and white sympathy. Now, some of us might not have been born when Emmett Till was murdered. However, we will never forget May 25th, 2020. Similar to Emmett Till, George Floyd wasn't the first African-American to be unjustifiably killed by police officers. But when the entire world witnessed the cruelty and inhumaneness of his murder, for many, it was a moment of utter grief and complete despair. When we saw his breath escape him, leaving his body limp and lifeless, lying in the street, it left us reeling and faced with the harsh reality of racism, injustice, police brutality, inequality, and being black in America. The 24th chapter of Luke tells the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the liturgical calendar, this passage transitions us from the Lenten season to Eastertide. However, the passage is very rich and it has some deep connections to the historic moment that we are living in right now. Two men are walking towards the village Emmaus and they're discussing Jesus's execution and the fact that his body was missing from the tomb. When Jesus out of nowhere approaches them and joins them on the journey, only they don't recognize who he is. He asks what it is that they're discussing and they stop in their tracks literally because they can't believe that he has not heard about the recent events. So they engage Jesus in conversation and they say, you must be the only one in town who doesn't know what's going on. Where is it that you are from? They can't believe that he doesn't know what has happened. They proceed to explain the unusual weekend events regarding Jesus to Jesus himself, again, not knowing who he is. They admit we are messed up right now. We are lost. And that's why we're walking around here looking sad and crazy. 
They engage him in conversation and then Jesus walks ahead of them, but they ask him to stay the night with them because of the lateness of the hour. Jesus joins them in their village and they invite him to table fellowship. When he sits down and breaks the bread, the Bible says that their eyes are opened and they recognize him and then he vanishes. They later return to Jerusalem and they declare that Jesus has risen from the dead to the disciples and their companions. One very interesting part of the text is when Cleopas turns to Jesus and says, but we had hoped that he was the one that will redeem Israel. That comes from verse 21. For Cleopas, his traveling companion, and many others, their worlds had just been shattered. Their lives were turned upside down as someone who they had placed their hopes and dreams in was cruelly and inhumanely murdered on display for all of the world to witness by way of a public lynching and like George Floyd by someone who represented the state. In that moment, they expressed their grief, their pain, and their deep disappointment because their world had just been turned upside down. The Bible even says in the NIV translation that when Jesus approached the disciples, their faces were downcast. They were visibly sad and they were in pain. Now understand that Jesus's death shook up the entire city of Jerusalem. They did not know what to make of what had just occurred. They were experiencing communal mourning. Their whole community was messed up and lost. And they probably even said to themselves, wow, we were living in this oppressed, in this marginalized community. community. And finally, we had someone with some sense, someone who knew our struggle, someone who knew our oppression, who knew the issues that we've dealt with, who knew how to communicate with the politicians and someone who we respected, who we were proud of and who gave us hope. Jesus was one of them. He was someone that they could identify with and they saw themselves in him. Now, they probably had to even ask themselves, do we still try to be a community or do we tear stuff up? Do we still try to do what this man was showing us or do we burn things down? That tension that lies in community and chaos. Now, when you have all of your stock in one person that you know can turn everything around and that person is now gone, it makes you wonder how in the world do I pick up and move on? How do I go on from here? Because the one person who can help us is gone. Jesus was their patron. He understood their issues and he spoke up for the underdogs. One theologian and scholar said, in reimagining Jesus as revolutionary, the goal of his ministry was to radically change the distribution of authority and power, goods and resources, so that all people, particularly little people, or the least of these, as Jesus called them, might have lives free of political repression enforced hunger and poverty and undue insecurity. But in one moment, all of that had been erased. Jesus was articulate. He had the right passion. He was the one who helped them to imagine a new world other than the one that they were living in. Their hopes were crushed. Possibilities were suffocated. They were running out of air and they too could not breathe. Now, I can imagine that many African-Americans woke up on the morning of May 26 after seeing the viral video feeling just like Cleopas, their faces downcast. Or perhaps on just last Saturday after the murder of Rashard Brooks or after you learned of Breonna Taylor's death, Ahmaud Arbery, or when you learned that Robert Fuller was lynched in 2020 in Los Angeles. Some probably said, well, we had a black president. We thought President Obama would be the one who would redeem blacks and Hispanics and Asians and other groups of people who have been systemically oppressed and experienced racism and discrimination. 
In the transference of one administration to the next, hope had faded and diminished. Now, hope is necessary because hopeful stories are windows into the wonderful possibilities that life has to offer. Dr. J. Alfred Smith once said, hope is a tiny sprout growing up in cracked concrete. And Pauli Murray described it as a song in a weary throat. But the beauty of this passage lies in what happens when we mourn. As they pick themselves back up, hurting and in pain, and they try to go on with life the best way they could, because although it's tough, life must go on. But the beauty of this passage is that in the midst of their grief, they encountered Jesus and their lives were forever changed. Now, the text tells us that they came to a fork in the road and they turned to Jesus not knowing who he was. And they said, it's late. So they asked if he wanted to stay and finish his journey in the morning. They probably said, we don't need for you to be out in the dark like this, Jesus. Just come on home with us. So Jesus goes home with them incognito. Again, they did not know who he was. When they got to the table and they started breaking bread, the one who was the guest became the host. Because of their hospitality, an invitation of a complete stranger. Mind you, this is all the while uh, they're trying to minister to him in their grief and in their pain. And they're trying to serve his need and meet his need. He turns around and meets their need. And that is just like the kind of God that we serve. By being hospitable towards a stranger, they did not miss God. They stopped and they entertained him in his obscurity. He was inconspicuous. He didn't have a title or a position. He didn't have degrees and letters behind his name. He didn't offer them money or a new car. And what's one thing we should note about them, they didn't turn their nose up. They weren't too busy, but they stopped and they took the time. And as a result, it blessed their entire lives by stopping and taking time with a complete stranger. On the roads in our lives that we have traveled, how many times have we looked over someone and felt like they were insignificant or felt like they had nothing to offer us or nothing deep or profound to tell us? We didn't have the time, the space, or the capacity to deal with them right then and there. Some of us even claim that we are waiting on the Lord but you could have completely missed him. They experience God in the form of a stranger. And our lesson today encourages us to not miss God, to not be so busy or important that we miss God. How many times has God even put us in a situation to see if we would allow him in and we missed him? Here it is that we have to be open because we never know where the risen Christ will appear. Right when you turn your nose up, you could have missed God. And you can't make God show up. You have to wait on it. They were going about their lives when all of this happened. Again, the one who was invited in as the guest now becomes the host. And that's the goal of our worship services. That's the goal of our ministries, our lives, and our witness, that we invite God in. We invite the epiclesis. We invoke the spirit to come down and take over. We are seeing some disturbing stuff right now in the world, but our passage suggests to us that in our storms and in our grief strickenness, Jesus can still give us a revelation in our despair, Jesus can still give us hope. While they were walking into the setting sun, when it was getting late in the evening, they were joined by the risen sun and they experienced the risen sun in the presence of a stranger. They had no idea, but when Jesus finished with them, they said, didn't our hearts burn within? Now, listening to this man, something happened to their hearts. They said, our broken hearts are now burning again. 
And tonight I came to tell someone that your broken heart can burn again. I know many of us are outraged and we're angry, but your broken heart can burn again. For those dealing with betrayal and wounds, your broken heart can burn again. For those dealing with grief from the loss of a loved one, your broken heart can burn again. For those dealing with illnesses or a loved one who is sick, a family member being incarcerated, depression and trauma, your broken heart can burn again. And in this season, may the fire from Pentecost ignite something deep down on the inside that just will not allow us to do what we've always done. We can't even expect for things to return to normal when, because normal is a state of lingering illness for black people. Now the imagery in this text is so powerful that a broken, deeply disappointed heart is once again set on fire and burning again. When we pray, our prayer should be, Lord, cause our broken hearts to burn again from the disappointments that we carry. So for those of you who have crushed hopes and shattered dreams, for the mothers who are nervous every time your son leaves the house, and for the wives who live in fear for their husband's safety, even for the men who are afraid, probably even traumatized when you encounter a white police officer, whether you admit it or not, Today, the many tears that we have cried in recent weeks and the anguish that the black community has felt since the death of George Floyd, just know that there is something to make of these catastrophic events. 100 days after Emmett Till's murder, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a Montgomery City bus and was arrested for violating Alabama's bus segregation laws. Rosa Parks said that she thought about going to the back of the bus, but then she thought about Emmett Till and she just couldn't do it. Martin Luther King Jr. was just a young minister at that time, and he led the Montgomery bus boycott for over a year. Many of the students that started the sit-ins across the South were around the same age as Emmett Till when they saw his disfigured body in Jet Magazine. And just a few years later, they refused to accept segregation any longer. It's been 22 days since George Floyd was killed, and I wonder how his murder will affect each of us. We're seeing a lot of performative activism. Currently, Black Lives Matter is trending, and we're witnessing people moving beyond words to action. And because of the activism, we are experiencing the proliferation of a movement. This season right now is one of reflection and looking back over the last 401 years, but it is also a season of looking ahead. And in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, where do we go from here? I can imagine that he wouldn't want us to linger on the past but instead to use these horrific events to propel us forward. So in closing, this movement has given us a new glimpse of God. So it's important that we don't miss God and that we stay woke. You don't know when the Lord is going to show up. Our text that we covered today, it's also a text about discernment and recognizing the presence of the Lord. And can we do that in the middle of protests and riots and chaos in the middle of a pandemic? But I encourage you tonight, don't be distracted, but stay the course, fight for justice and pray for the hand of God to work. The presence of the Lord is here right now in an unsuspecting source. Whites standing with blacks, universities and companies committed to policy change. We cannot afford to miss this moment. Don't come out of the pandemic the same way you went in, but come out richer with knowledge and understanding and a passion and a drive for justice. This is a journey, not a destination. And the work is ongoing. So let us commit 
to finding practical ways that we can get into the fight for justice and we all can do our part. Wherever you find yourself, let your light shine right there. Once again, everyone will make it downtown or to the National Mall or to the Black Lives Matter Plaza or to the White House. But what can you do around your house? What can you do in your community at your place of employment? The Lord is calling us to hire in this season and to do more, to pray, to protest, and to participate on our journey towards justice. God bless you. Wow. That was super fantastic. You covered all areas. That was great. That was great. And let me add that, um, you know, the world is looking at the church. And, right. uh, you know, Jesus did say, he said, ye are the salt of the earth. And the purpose mm -hmm. for salt is not just for flavoring. It is to preserve. And then he said, we're the light of the world. And the purpose of a light is not just for flash, but it's to show the way. And that's what we have to do. The world is looking at the church, want, he, looking at the church to see what we're going to do. We cannot go back to business as usual. We have to do whatever we can to effect change in this last day gleaning. That was super fa I am so delighted that you took time out of your prodigious schedule because you are doing a lot of studying. <laughs> you are in a lot of classes uh, to be with us tonight. That was great. That was great. To you out Thank you so uh, on Facebook Live and YouTube who uh, viewed this um, uh, service tonight, this Bible study tonight, we would that you would uh, send a donation, send an offering. We want to do something significant in our communities. There are some people who lost their jobs. We want to make sure that they have bread. We want to make sure that they have something to eat. There's something that we do once a month, every month on the fourth Saturdays, but we want to do even more because the church, because the world is looking at the church. Also, if there's somebody that does not know Jesus and the free pardon of your sins, may we introduce Jesus Christ to you. A life without Christ is just an imagination. It's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. All you have to do is just say, Lord, come into my life right now. Forgive me for my sins. And if you're godly sorry for your sins and you repent and you make him the Lord of your life, then the Bible says that you are saved. And for you who are home, convalescent, you who are home, bedridden, you that are in the hospital, we pray for you now. The blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, it covers, it cleanses, it brings deliverance in the lives of the people. Father, we pray now that you would touch these bodies. You said in your word that we can come boldly to your throne and obtain, and obtain mercy and help in the time of need. And this is one of those times we're praying for those individuals who are convalescent. We're praying for those seniors who are afraid, who are in fear, who are afraid to go out. We are praying, oh God, that you would cover them and protect them. We're praying, oh God, for this country. We're praying for our state. We're praying for our city. Oh God, right now, in the name of Jesus, let your blood cover, bring deliverance. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you so much, Crystal. It was great. God bless you. We're gonna have Thank to, you for having we're me. We're going to have to, oh yes, we're going to have to do this again. And uh, I would love we'd like you. to say to everybody, we hope you enjoyed the, the uh, um, um, Bible study tonight. We're going to do more like these uh, in, in the weeks to come. God bless you and have a nice evening. God bless. Come on.
Friends, we're thankful for you, for your prayers and financial support. If you've enjoyed this message and have a prayer request, you can text or write us at Abundant Life Cathedral, Church of God in Christ, 4400 Old Pool Road, Raleigh, North Carolina. Also, if you would like to make a contribution, there are several giving platforms on the screen that you can use. Until this time next week, God bless.